Hello, my name is Karen Wells, and I'm here today to talk about uh, my book, my new book. It's called The Abortion Caravan, When Women Shut Down Government in the Battle for the Right to Choose. And I want to start by thanking some people. Uh, first of all, thank you to Massey Books for partnering on this venture, uh, our new experiments in virtual launching and virtual who knows everything else. Uh, very good of you to be part of this and hello to any of your customers who are, have tuned in. Another really important thanks to my publisher, Second Story Press, who stood behind this book and encouraged me to write it. Great thanks to them. And to an organization called the Feminist History Society. They have backed and supported a series of publications uh, dealing with women's stories in Canada, stories that undoubtedly would otherwise not be told. So many thanks there. But the biggest thank you, if you like, goes to the women, more than 40 women, who uh, I spoke to over the course of putting this book together. They were generous and kind. They told me immensely personal stories. And everybody seemed eager to talk about this. They wanted this story to be told. I, I got calls from people without me reaching out, um, which was, was quite wonderful. It, it is an important story. It's something that hasn't been talked about much. Uh, and I was very pleased to, to have written it. I made a radio documentary about the abortion caravan a number of years ago. And doing this book gave me the chance to dig in a little deeper. I particularly wanted to know more about these women, about who they were, why they decided to do this rather extraordinary thing, and what they were hoping to get out of it, what they thought about it in retrospect. So there's a fair bit of that in the book, because they were an assorted bunch of women, very different. Um, and uh, very audacious, brave, all of that. So let me tell you about uh, the women who were in the abortion caravan. There were 17 of them to start with. They were based in Vancouver. And they had met many of them at Simon Fraser University, which back in the late 60s was a very radical campus. Uh, it was uh, controlled chaos, if you like. And it had a spirit of vitality and energy that you is unequaled, I think. Uh, it, it was a great place to be. I, it's where I started my university education um, and couldn't have had more fun in lots of ways and um, couldn't have started to see the world in a different way more than I did at Simon Fraser. So it's an important place, important times. The women, the ones who met, decided that they wanted to get out of the ivory tower. They moved down into Vancouver and they started what was called the Vancouver Women's Caucus. They were all about activism on several different fronts, many of them economic. They wanted to make inroads in issues like equal pay and equal work. Uh, encouraging unions, more than encouraging unions, to see and understand women's issues. They were active in the area of daycare, uh, still are. It's one that hasn't been accomplished. And every Tuesday night in their little office uh, on Broadway, they ran what was called an abortion information service. Now, uh, context here. In the late 60s, abortion was illegal. It was an offense under the criminal code. Women who sought abortion and certainly doctors who performed abortion could be prosecuted and the doctors were, and they faced jail time. Uh, there's one particular doctor in Vancouver, Robert Makarov, who was charged and convicted and spent perhaps more time in jail than any other doctor in Canada. Uh, he performed abortions for women in safe circumstances out of a sense of fundamental justice. In 1969, the Government of Canada introduced abortion reforms. They were much trumpeted. Uh, this was when Pierre Trudeau uttered the phrase, 
the state has no place in the bedrooms of the nation. But when you got right down to it, they weren't, the reforms were bogus. They didn't get women any further uh, than they had been before. It required women to go before a panel of doctors and get medical approval to say, please, may I have an abortion? This was not seen as a decision of the woman. And uh, those committees of doctors were only, uh, only existed in very limited circumstances. So uh, it didn't mean much. So the women who came to see the abortion information service on a Tuesday night uh, on Broadway, they didn't want information. They wanted a safe legal abortion because as abortion was illegal, what happened was that women went to backstreet abortionists Many women died. The estimate was 1,000 to 2,000 a year in Canada. And if they didn't die, they sustained serious infections and uh, were sometimes rendered infertile and could have no other children. Women who had a bit more money, they were in better shape. They could uh, fly out of the country to jurisdictions where they could get a safe medical abortion. California was one, uh, the UK was another. Um, the women who had no money or who lived, as many Canadian women do, uh, out of access to uh, larger hospitals where there would be committees. Although the committees weren't up to much, I think only 1% of women who applied for abortion were. So these were the circumstances that the women were looking at, this Vancouver Women's Caucus. They decided uh, abortion was a strategically chosen issue. This was the abortion caravan because the Vancouver women thought that abortion was an issue that cut across geography, it cut across class lines, it cut across age. This uh, abortion was something that affected so many women. Uh, I think the number one in four families um, has encountered the issue of abortion. So the, they chose this issue strategically. It was not the daycare caravan, it was the abortion caravan for this reason. And it also uh, was an issue aimed strictly at, at government, because government controlled this. So they decided in late 1969 that this is what they would do. They assembled themselves, found 17 women, and they didn't know each other. A lot of these women had never met until the day they left the caravan, uh, which is quite amazing. Some of them at the beginning were Kind of in it for the adventure. Others were very much, uh, were very politically committed. And off they went. They were driving in uh, a Pontiac Parisian convertible belonging to Betsy Medley, who we'll hear more about in a minute, in a pickup truck driven by Charlotte Bedard. And that pickup truck had great big loudspeakers on either side because they blared their way into every town blasted the sound out. Uh, they put Revolution Now on as they drove into town. And then the third vehicle was a Volkswagen van, a very much a vehicle of the times. Um, and on the top of that van was a huge coffin. And it was a, a potent symbol, brilliantly chosen, it attracted attention everywhere they went. And the, the, the coffin symbolized the numbers of women who had died from the so they set off down Georgia Street from the Vancouver courthouse and they started to drive across the country. They stopped at towns along the way, cities along the way. They held rallies. They picked up more women, more cars as they went. And by the time they got to Ottawa, they were 500 strong. They had written very strong letters to government saying, uh, we want abortion taken out of the criminal court we will and we want, we demand to meet with the prime minister, with the health minister, the justice minister. You will meet us when we get to Ottawa. And that's what they were there to do, to put their demands forward. This is an age of confrontation. Uh, this, was no, this was not a time where you politely negotiated with government. Government didn't do that. So when they got to Ottawa, 500 of them having picked up these other women along the way. Government refused to meet them. The NDP gave them some support. Um, there were I think, three NDP members of parliament and one conservative there to meet them. And they were angry. 
They, nobody was paying attention to them. They'd driven thousands of miles and nobody was paying attention. They decided to do something more. And they met a, a meeting that lasted 16 hours, 200 women deciding by consensus that they would invade the galleries of the House of Commons. They got themselves respectable clothing. They went to secondhand stores all over Ottawa. They got chains. They had to go out and buy chains because they were going to put the chains in their purses and then chain themselves to the seats in the galleries. And they wrote a collective speech. 36 of them made their way into the galleries. And uh, as question period began, one of them popped up and began the speech. And as soon as one stood up and began speaking, the guards would come along and try to get her out of there. But because of the chains, it was slow. As soon as one stood up and was taken out, another woman at another section of the gallery stood up. And on they went. And eventually, they spoke so loudly and for so long that the Speaker of the House closed down the session of government. And the next day, they were on the front pages of every newspaper in Canada. They had made their mark. So uh, what they did was important. Some people said it didn't count for much because abortion law wasn't changed for 18 years. But what they did was they put it on the table, put the issue on the table, made it acceptable. Nobody jumped at the chance, but made it acceptable for women to talk about this issue that affected so many of them about abortion. And that was their achievement. Um, what happened along the way, there were adventures, there were disagreements, there were tears, there was um, a lot of difficulty. It wasn't easy. There's no social media. Uh, they couldn't afford long distance phone calls, which were very expensive back then. Yet somehow they managed to organize this whole thing the first grassroots national women's movement by action. Um, and that's what they wanted to do. And for many years, uh, nobody talked about it. They were almost made to feel ashamed of what they'd done because it was so outrageous. Um, but it's a story so worth telling. They were quite phenomenal, those women. It's also worth telling now at a time when for quite a while now we've seen attempts particularly in the u.s to pull back abortion rights for women um, and what we're seeing right now in this time of covid are several states in the in, in america that have used the opportunity of physical distancing of more powers granted to government to pull back so the state of texas just recently declared abortion and a not essential service, and therefore they've closed down abortion clinics. And I think something similar is happening in Alabama, in Oklahoma, in uh, Poland, which has never had uh, open access to abortion. Uh, the government under the emergency powers that it has, has now uh, taken away one of the categories under which abortion is possible. Um, and of course, with no social, with no uh, ability to go outside and demonstrate, it, it can't be countered by women. Part of what this book is about too is the issue of when, when you go forward and and break the rules, color outside the lines, practice a little civil disobedience, and these women were pretty good at it. So it's very much a Vancouver story. Makes me happy because I grew up in BC. Um, and that was a, a big part of the issue too. The Eastern women weren't that keen on listening to what the Westerners had to say. Uh, and that was another battle they fought along the way. I'd like to read you a little bit from it, um, starting right at the beginning. I should say that every chapter has uh, a quote from one of the women. A little something to live by if you like uh, and uh, chapter one a quote from Catherine Keat who lives in Nanaimo one of the best things about being underestimated she says is that you can get away with it how right she is Monday April 27th 1970 Betsy Medley got up washed her face and brushed her teeth she put on a little makeup 
pulled her blondish hair up on top of her head and bobby pinned it in place then she wrapped her hand around the can of hairspray lifted it high and doused her hair into submission it was what she did every morning but this was not just any morning this was the day the abortion caravan left vancouver three vehicles 17 women 10 stops, rallies at every stop, an arrival in Ottawa on Mother's Day weekend for a march and a meeting with Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau or the Justice Minister or the Health Minister or all three. They, the women of the abortion caravan, would demand that abortion be taken out of the criminal code. Demand, not ask. The abortion caravan was Betsy Medley's idea. She had said more than once that they could get rid of abortion law this year if they all acted together and made this abortion caravan happen. It was a naively ambitious plan. Naive or not, 16 days later, they had closed down Parliament and they were on the front page of every newspaper in Canada. But this was the first morning. Betsy Medley had only just got out of bed. She was the odd woman out in the abortion caravan and she knew it everyone else getting ready that morning down below in the city betsy lived in west vancouver was in her 20s most were students she was a middle-aged middle-class woman she was also divorced and divorce was difficult for women in the late 60s it carried with it social criticism women whispered disapprovingly behind their hands she was divorced Betsy Medley still wore her wedding ring. It was easier that way. She had four children. She had a job in the provincial fire marshal's office and watched the young men around her climb the corporate ladder while she was red circled. Ineligible for promotion, she was rightly convinced that it was because she was a woman. Mrs. Medley, as she was known at work, was in a woman's job with woman's wages, and that made her angry very angry furious was a word she used a lot she'd quit that job quit with some pleasure for this trip to ottawa given up that paltry woman's wage the caravan was the culmination of six months work letter writing demonstrations meetings press releases speeches the abortion caravan meant everything to betsy Medley. it would be a lot tougher than she expected in every way the days would be longer, the arguments fiercer, and she would come out on the losing end. When Betsy Medley returned to her home in West Vancouver three weeks later, she was isolated and in tears. But that was down the road. The morning of April 27th was all optimism and excitement. She'd been, I, I should tell you, she'd been thinking about the caravan for a couple of years and she had gone to an all candidates meeting uh, in 1968 during the election that elected Pierre Trudeau uh, as prime minister uh, and brought the liberals in with a sweeping majority. So let me tell you a little bit more about this. She'd gone to an all candidates meeting in her writing to ask some questions. She was a woman who believed in the parliamentary process. That alone made her unique in the caravan. The others were decidedly extra parliamentary. Anne Roberts, who was part of the Vancouver Women's Caucus, although she had not signed up for the caravan, put it simply, we were working outside the system because we had not been able to attain our rights within the system. Betsy Medley went to that all candidates meeting, wanting to know more about the proposed changes to the criminal code, changes that were supposed to introduce reforms to abortion. When she went to that meeting, she asked questions. Her liberal candidate was Jack Davis. She stood up and asked her questions about proposed abortion reforms. Jack Davis laughed her off. Betsy Medley never forgot that. Next, she went to her NDP candidate looking for support. But Betsy Medley was let down by her NDP candidate as well. Again, she got little more than a patronizing smile. 
being scoffed at and laughed at by a too sure of himself liberal candidate and underestimated by the New Democrats, who she thought would have been her political allies. That's how and why the idea grew in Betsy Medley's head. Now, here she was on the morning of April 27th, her small suitcase packed and ready, her keys in her hand, turning to lock the front door behind her. Her car was sitting in her West Vancouver driveway with on to Ottawa spelt out in black tape on the hill, on the hood. She was proud of that car. It was a great boat of a thing, a late model pale yellow Pontiac Parisian convertible that had belonged to her husband. Sometime after the divorce, her son went out to Alberta and in the spirit of times, liberated the car and drove it back to Vancouver. She'd married Bob Medley when she was Betsy Wood, a Vancouver teenager barely out of high school. And she'd had her first baby, her daughter Cherry, when she was 19. They divorced in 1967, and she had been on her own ever since. But on that April Monday morning in 1970, she was 40 years old, about to drive more than 3,000 miles to Ottawa, and she was not on her own anymore. There was a happy band of women waiting at the foot of the mountain. She turned the lock in the front door, threw her bag in the trunk of the car and climbed in. The top of the convertible was down as Betsy Medley pulled out of the driveway, freewheeled down the mountain and breezed across Lionsgate Bridge into Vancouver. Thank you. There's the book, The Abortion Caravan, when women, what, what is it? When women shut down government in the battle for the right to choose. I'm Karen Wells, thank you for listening.